so much for having us. Uh, uh, this is uh, labeled as a mock MDD. So it's a multidisciplinary discussion and uh, I'm very happy to uh, uh, be tasked to define the cases. Uh, these are all hot cases from the Vanderbilt ILD program. Uh, they all been seen in our clinic within the last three months and I'll be here playing the role of the confused clinician which is oftentimes where I live uh, anyway. So I have uh, Dr. Joyce Johnson from Vanderbilt. She is not only a world-class lung pathologist, she is also a great photographer. You see all the slides are, are from uh, her camera. Dr. Deja Degensoy from the University of Chicago. Uh, Dr. Uh, Steve Nathan from uh, Inova Fairfax. Uh, we have also an up-and-coming youngster from University of uh, uh, Washington in Seattle, Dr. Ganesh Ragoon. Uh, and Dr. Restrepo from the uh, UT San Antonio for the, for the, uh, the home team. <coughs> so again, we'll try to keep it very, um, uh, very informal uh, as it should be. So for, let's go for the first case. So the first case is a 66-year-old, uh, never-smoking uh, white lady who came uh, to see us for a second opinion. She had one year of non-productive cough. She had mild shortness of breath and exercise limitation. She worked in a warehouse that stored artificial flowers and, and decorative objects. Some, upon much uh, asking her, she admitted that some of them were made with bird <coughs> feathers. Uh, so think about a very dirty Hobby Lobby. Uh, many co-workers had respiratory complaints and the owner of the whole operation died from pulmonary fibrosis. Her, the basement of her house had some water leak and black mold infestation that she cleaned herself but the respiratory symptoms developed approximately eight months after the episode. In physical exam, she had crackled, but interestingly more audible uh, in the apices as opposed to the bases. She had no CTG stigmata uh, by either uh, uh, history or physical examination. A very comprehensive serological uh, evaluation was negative, and she came with a lung biopsy uh, that was available for review. This lady was given a, a, a very, um, uh, final recommendation by, by the local pulmonologist that she should stop working, and she didn't like that. So she went on our team. <coughs> Dr. Restrepo. Thank you. <coughs> um, the full wire function? Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> That's advanced Chinese for me. <laughs> This is uh, her initial um, set of pulmonary function tests from the, the original pulmonologist, and this is when she saw us. As you can see, there has been uh, a slight improvement in accuracy. Uh, the LCO is about the same, uh, and from just one month uh, ago. Uh, and she had no uh, hypoxemia for exercise when she saw us, nor at the original, um, the original pulmonologist. So, uh, right. Thank you. Okay, so let's start with the uh, upper lung zone. Um, uh, as you can see, the um, important finding, you start seeing errors of some uh, by apical pleural thickening and some relatively uh, early stages of interlobular septal thickening and reticulation. Uh, going further down, more of the same, by apical pleural thickening and some interlobular septal thickening. Uh, going further down, uh, interesting in this case that you start seeing a relatively asymmetrical pattern. That is not that rare in patients with the different forms of pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, not always we see symmetry in the involvement of the bilateral lungs. You can see that there is more reduction in volume in the left lung compared to the, to the right. Again, more interlobular septal thickening in the left lung. Uh, some um, areas of patchy densities in the left lung uh, I don't see uh, uh, honeycombing. Um, is, is she a smoker or never a smoker? Never a smoker. Yeah. Um, and again, asymmetrical involvement with more significant uh, disease in the left lung and areas of ground glass opacities. So, um, do we have expiratory images here? So, in expiratory images, um, uh, it's more obvious the presence of some. Uh, areas of uh, differential attenuation in the lung parenchyma, which is relatively subtle, uh, uh, except in the bases. In the bases, you see more obvious 
uh, areas of mosaic pattern of long attenuation as expected, exploratory images are exactly for, for that purpose. So uh, in summary, I would say that uh, imaging findings are not typical or suggestive of UAP. And given the presence of uh, mosaic attenuation and indicating air trapping, uh, according to the guidelines that we have, will suggest an alternative diagnosis, the, the best uh, uh, consideration. And because of our trapping, something like hypersensitivity and pneumonitis will be high in my differential. Thanks so much. <coughs> so question for the clinicians in the, you know, this lady came uh, for us for second opinion, she carried the surgical biopsy on the arm and then when she walked in. Uh, with the data that you have now, and, and, and knowing what we know now, um, would any of you have sent her for a biopsy or not before we? And what do you think she has? Do we, do we think we have a diagnosis? Do we have enough elements now to establish a diagnosis? <coughs> Deji, Stephen, I, um, I think the pretest likelihood is very high it's going to be chronic HP. I would probably still send her for a biopsy. I think the, in the context of chronic HP, I'd like to see the lung morphology. I want to see how much inflammation, active inflammation there is. Uh, how much fibrosis there is, and especially as our therapies evolve with more recent data, I think that becomes important in terms of how we might ultimately direct our therapy. Mm -hmm. Deirdre? I agree with Dr. Nathan. I think the pretest probability of hypersensitivity pneumonitis is pretty high. A middle-aged woman with smoking gun inhalational exposures um, relatively preserved lung function from what we saw, but a CAT scan that's pretty convincing for HP. It suggests that she may have had some identification of the antigen and avoidance of that because we saw a nine points increase in our FVC in the intervening period. So I wouldn't push for a lung biopsy. It seems like the data is pretty convincing. If I need to do additional testing, I might just get a bronchoscopy with a lavage and mm -hmm. see what the lymphocyte count on that is. So the, and how, what would that be? What, what kind of, lymph, what kind of uh, 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 results you've seen there. If, if it was HP, what would you see? In the if it was HP, I would expect uh, lymphocytic predominance. Mm -hmm. Now, the value actually ranges widely in clinical practice, but something above 25, 30 uh, percent mm -hmm. lymphocyte count, in addition to this data we have, will be pretty convincing. Yeah. Okay. Ganesh. So, the clinical probability of it to be HP is very high. Everybody agrees that you don't need a major, major expert to say that. So temporally related to her occupation history and the findings is highly consistent with HP, regardless of whether you want to do a lavage or what else can it be? She doesn't have connective tissue disease. She does not have uh, any other exposure history. Uh, it doesn't look like a UIP pattern. There is no family history. There is no, so this is not IPF. Could this be NSIP? Sure, it could be NSIP, but the temporal relationship with the exposure history, is, even if she has NSIP, <coughs> you're not going to ask her to continue working. <laughs> That's, that's uh, Steve Nathan. That's a good call. So, so, I was agreeing with you, Ganesh. So even if she has an SIP, you're not going to ask her to continue to work. And of course, what uh, has already been said, she is adamant. She wants to know the diagnosis. Even though, in other words, she doesn't believe in you as an expert telling her that's what it is. So she wants to be convinced. So you tell, look, I don't think you need to be convinced. Well, I'm telling you as that. But if she really wants to, then you're going to, as I told this morning, in the, in the surgical lung biopsy talk, that of course the mortality rate is there, there's 2% mortality or so. So you need to weigh that into accountability and see where, what's the difference in the outcome management of, so she's not going to, she's going to get steroids anyway, regardless. So, so one option would, so it, it, it comes by, the bottom line is how much of a need that she really wants to, and if that is the case, then I would just, Go for a surgical lung biopsy. Doing a BAL is okay. You're going to do a BAL, not so much to see a lymphocyte, but you want to make sure that there's nothing else going on in terms of other infection or something which doesn't seem to be on a clinical suspicion. So she will be an okay candidate for surgical lung biopsy, but I don't need a surgical lung biopsy at all for this one. Yeah, I think uh, that, that was exactly the argument uh, that that you know how much she needed to know. Yeah, right. Yeah, correct. And if a bronchial lavage, as has been said, you know, if you have a high lymphocyte, then you're going to have one, two, and three more factors to go to the high probability of a confident diagnosis that this is HP. 
Correct. And the, the question is how, at what level your, your patient will be happy with, uh, with the evidence. It right? depends I mean, upon exactly the right. view and your patient, yep. right? really, right? It depends yep. upon that rapport and comfort. But on the other hand, every now and then we do come across an, an individual who does not trust the doctor, yep. no matter how experienced and expertise mm -hmm. uh, he has. The, but like the bottom line is that she loves you, but she loves her work. She wants to keep working. Okay, but then I will tell her this. <laughs> you are going to be, you love your work. You're going to love your work for two weeks or one year. So we ask you for one to go ahead and love your work for two weeks and die. That's, for your, that's how I'll tell you. Steve. Uh, before we look at the lung biopsy, and I don't know what the results of the lung biopsy are. Uh -huh. You know? Uh, no, I don't. Oh, okay. I have no idea. But a, a danger, not a, I don't believe it's a danger. What if we get the lung biopsy and it shows a UIP pattern? And nothing else. Well, that's when we get into the discussions. Okay, that's where the multidisciplinary discussion. Are you going to question the pathologist? Well, are you sure it's UIP? Is there bronchial metaplasia? Is there airway central fibrosis? <clears throat> are you looking at it properly? Do look at show me. That's how I'll be questioning. No, no, I was going to make the point. Even if it does show a UIP pattern, I think there's enough on history, there's mm -hmm. enough on CT to call a chronic HP. We know you can have a UIP pattern of injury in the context of chronic HP. But I do wonder if some people might get down that slippery slope and see a UIP pattern and say, ah, it's IPF. No, 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 wait. If you have UIP, which yeah. is equivocal UIP, the way that have been written in the, in the criteria, so to speak, and if there is absolutely no suggestion in terms of bronchial metaplasia, lymphocytes, et cetera, then yes, you will have IPF. Oh, I, I would disagree. Why will you disagree? <laughs> because I think it's you getting can good see now. UIP <laughs> Come closer. Of, uh, HP. You will have a UIP like, not a UIP. Well, UIP pattern. You can see. No, a no, no, no. UIP. You remember there is UIP, which is no airway centric, no this, no that, and then there is indeterminate UIP. Then there is past probable and all of that. So if it's a UIP like, I agree with you. But if it's a clear cut UIP with no lymphocytes, then this is IPF. Well, does it matter if it's fibrotic and she has fibrotic lung disease now? It does matter entering... because she wants to continue to expose, right? Correct. We're, talking oh, about, we're not talking about, we're talking about this individual. Absolutely. She, she wants to go and continue to work. Yep. Well, let's, uh, hopefully the biopsy does show UIP pattern because we can continue this discussion. <laughs> yeah, one whole <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, before you one. Before you go to the biopsy, I was just curious, what prompted the need for a surgical lung biopsy, given its morbidity and mortality? A 2% risk of mortality Correct. with surgical lung biopsy is, in my mind, absolutely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Two out of every 100 people who get a surgical lung biopsy will die from a diagnostic test. In 2019, that is absolutely unacceptable. So yeah. what prompted the need to pursue a surgical lung biopsy in this case? Was it the patient persisting, or was it the clinicians that wanted more information? Correct. So to keep, keep up with, uh, you know, uh, the analogies to politics, and she persisted, um, if you recall the, the event with uh, one of the senators. Uh, the, so the, the pulmonologist that worked her up, uh, he, he uh, was very diligent, did a very good workup, and, and told her, I think you have CHP, there's enough elements here, you know, you shouldn't be working, you just should take a, a, a couple months off and see what happens. And then, like you pointed out, her lung function did improve some. Yeah. Uh, she was adamant that she needed more, uh, more proof okay. than that. Sorry, sorry to, I know that you have other cases too. So, so the point is this. It gets better, this is no, easy. I'm sure it does. <laughs> yeah. We can talk, I'm yeah. sure it is. Then the other way to do it is also, if she doesn't believe you as an expert, then you offer to a second expert or a third expert. Mm -hmm. If all the three experts say, look, I don't want a biopsy, then who's going to do the biopsy? Yeah. Oh, you'd be surprised. No, that, I, I understand you'll be surprised, but that's how the clinical judgment has to come in, right? Yeah. If, the, if three experts say, no, you don't need a biopsy, and what he's saying is 2%, then you are very adamant, will die? No, they might not die. Yeah. It depends upon where you do the surgery yeah. as well. So you can't be adamant that two people out of 100 will die. No, that's not true. I, I think in the right hands, yeah. and, you know, I, I think it's less than that. If you choose, I think sometimes VATS biopsy gets a bad rap because you're taking candidates who shouldn't get a lung biopsy and, and subjecting them to that. I do agree with you 100%. And the data shows that two to 10% of these studies show high rate of mortality. And most of these were, were done in centers with expertise in lung biopsies, but definitely is a range, uh, confidence interval between the two, where it could be less than 2% or more than 2%. But that mean is still rather um, high. Um, gives me worry. I, th I think we all agree that getting, letting a doctor get close to you with a scalpel is not a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you avoid it for all, at all costs, if you, if you can. So, George.
So when we're actually doing a, a real-time multidisciplinary discussion, um, in, in order to defend myself against these kinds of questions, I always say two things. First of all, where were these biopsies taken relative to the imaging? And second of all, did I think they were generous and adequate to form an impression, or were they limited or whatever? So I'll say about this case that there was plenty of tissue, there were several biopsies, and all of the biopsies looked the same one to another. So that, I think that's worth knowing. Um, so all of the biopsies had areas that looked like this, and I think you can appreciate that there's no residual normal architecture here. We have a lot of dense fibrosis, um, and then these dilated air spaces that have large airway type epithelium and a good bit of inflammation in between these spaces. So there's nothing recognizable here. And I think this is microscopic honeycombing. It obviously doesn't rise to honeycombing on the imaging, but it would be in my world. Um, and then there were other areas around these end stage areas that look like this, where you can actually draw a line between the end stage uh, areas that are over here. And then you have these two areas that are actually, when you get closer, turn out to be bronchovascular bundles. And so there's scarring that is centered on small airways, which is an exclusionary criterion for UIP patterns. It is not UIP. Um, and there's a good bit of interstitial mononuclear inflammation and some early fibrosis around these small airways that eventually will probably end up looking like this. And some peribronchial or metaplasia which is evidence of prior and repeated small airway injury and repair. Um, so this is a bronchiolocentric process. And then there were occasional, in all slides, loosely formed granulomas with giant cells that did not contain any polarizable material and a pretty dense active uh, lymphocytic infiltrate with a fair number of plasma cells. Um, and then there were occasional granulomas that had these laminated calcifications that I think would qualify as shaman bodies, which are characteristic of both hypersensitivity or we see them in sarcoid also. But given the overall pattern, I think this was actually signed out definitively as hypersensitivity pneumonitis. Any questions about the morphology? Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. In this uh, particular circumstance, would any of you have considered a cryobiopsy? Uh, no, I think a, a cry, we don't do cryos at our place for the most part because we have an excellent surgeon who does VATS, same day VATS, they're in and out in you know, four to six hours. But I think it's entirely reasonable to do cryo in a situation like this, especially if you suspect chronic HP, which tends to be bronchiocentric. I think you could have possibly gotten your answer from that. Yeah, so again, uh, the answer is depend, depends on your available expertise, right? So if you have a, a good team with, that does cryobiopsis, this is one of the conditions that uh, the pathologists can probably get enough uh, tissue for, for, uh, for an answer. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and uh, move on to case two. Do we have phase two loaded? So, so do, you didn't tell us that she's yeah, thinking, thinking about exposure to birds? Is we are she's loading that deck now. She is thinking about exposure. I mean, as, uh, this was okay. done last week? No. <laughs> about a month ago. A month ago, okay. So she's still thinking about it. She's thinking Okay. Folks from Mississippi are very hard to <laughs> <laughs> It's a patient's yeah. choice. She knows what the odds are. So she saw the boss die, and if she chooses to go in that direction. The, the point of the reason I'm saying is I think it has to be established beforehand of doing the procedure of uh, reluctantly, because you know, the, all our experts are saying we don't need it. And then if she's not going to embark on the, the point that was made, then why, why did it? Is, is all it is. Yeah. So I think that's a very good point, right? I think that uh, my, if I were the first pulmonologist, I would probably tell the lady, Okay, um, will this change your mind? Will you, if this proves that this to be CHP, will change the way you, you, you live your life? Will you, if the answer is maybe not, then I, I, I would tell her, yeah, you should do it. In addition to Dr. Agu's point um, about bird exposure or avian antigens, she also seems to have exposure to mold as well, mm -hmm. Correct. right? And, and that has been a sticking point for a lot of patients where they have a basement that has been flooded with mold in the past. 
they are, it's incredibly hard to get them to relocate from that um, living environment. Mm -hmm. And so that challenge should be brought to them aforehand before yeah. going on such a... Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So that, that's a very good point because she would want to continue to expose the bird if it's a mold. Yeah. There's no way that you can tell it's a mold associated HP versus a bird associated. Correct. So that's, the, that's the problematic issue here. I, I think the fact that her boss died from uh, from pulmonary fibrosis probably would be, for me, would be a little bit yeah, of yeah, a yeah, but still, um, again, those yellow points flag. were taken, so the environment history yeah. has to be completely eradicated as much as possible. True. We have oh. one question from the audience. Sorry, can, okay. Um, so she should not do her job anymore, and she should clean her house, but as far as, like, prednisone or Ovev for kind of progressive fibrosing disease? Very good question. So, yeah, so my approach is like, I, I told her uh, that her lung function was uh, was improved. She was, uh, in terms of um, uh, symptoms, she had largely any, I mean, she had no limitation um, or, or of significance to her. So I told her that you, you need to stop working, get out of that environment, uh, clean your house, make sure it's still clean, and then let's reassess your lung function in three to six months and see where you are. Uh, and so, do, would you guys have done anything different? Do you have, would you give her steroids? Would you give her? I, prob I probably right would, have, would have treated that, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, certainly uh, trial of steroids and then maybe introduce microphenolates as a steroid preserving mm -hmm. agent. And perhaps even more of a case, knowing that she is going to co continue to have the exposure. So, knowing that the course is more likely to be progressive with the continued exposure, mm -hmm. I'd be inclined to treat. Uh, I guess it becomes a philosophical issue as well in terms of um, if a patient's not taking herself out of the environment, not helping herself, do you still treat? I think I think I would. Yeah, I think that uh, I, I see it as a joint decision between she and her. What makes sense to her? You know, I think I don't think you're wrong doing either way. Quite frankly, I think that Ganesh, what do you think? No, I think the point has been well made. I mean. For HP, two things are important. One, you avoid the exposure history as much as, as completely as possible. Second, immune modulating drugs are appropriate. Prednisone and mycophenone would be an appropriate consideration. Uh, and to see how she would respond. A, a patient with HP, especially hers, um, with, a, with a temporal relationship is not going to get better unless there is complete avoidance. And if some of these patients will still behave like an IPF later on, and that's a different ballgame in terms of whether antifibrotic therapy needs to be given to those individuals later on or so. So that's a different territory. But then I would also bring into this context that if it is so bad that if she deteriorates, because not everybody with pregnancy or mycophenol will respond, even though that they do not be further exposed, and then you will want to be considering lung transplantation as an option as well at some point. Excellent. So we're going to uh, move on to case it's a, which, a, which is a little bit more complicated. So it's a young man, 37-year-old Caucasian gentleman that uh, was di had been diagnosed with sarcoidosis 10 years before, and he's coming <coughs> to see you to establish pulmonary care. So he's, he's a very athletic person. In 2005, he noticed dyspnea while cycling, uh, and then 2006, he uh, was diagnosed with sarcoidosis based on a CT scan and restrictive PFTs. Uh, he was, he was uh, on the table to have bronchoscopy, had the first biopsy, had a pneumothorax, it was aborted, and no tissue was obtained. So they treated, or he, they established the diagnosis based on imaging alone, okay? But no treatment was established. So 10 years went on, and he, in 2016, presented again to a local pulmonologist with minimal symptoms. He was uh, becoming fatigued and short of breath while jogging. He had a, a, a minimal non-productive cough, but but frequent enough to, to bother him. He had some growing lymphadenopathies and on and off, and he had no CTD stigmata. He had a desk job, no significant exposures. So he did some woodwork as a hobby, um, no other known exposures. His mom had a lung disease. She lived far away, and it wasn't clear to him exactly what that was, but she had been sick with, with some ailment uh, for, for a few years now. Physical exam had a few bibasal crackles uh, on auscultation, so it was not abnormal. Not normal. So the initial uh, pulmonary function test, FEC was uh, 78 percent. There was no airflow obstruction. He had a diffusion impairment, uh, a mild diffusion impairment, 89 percent, still considered within normal limits, uh, but certainly a bit concerning for a, for a 37 year old gentleman. We did not have lung volumes. He did not have hypoxemia on exertion, and the serologies were reported as negative. Any other information? Then the guy's stopping when you need. 
So we had his initial CT from 2006 uh, to review, and this is uh, what we have. <coughs> okay, so upper lung zone, uh, not that much, maybe a little bit of interlocular septa thickening and minimal reticulation. Uh, going further down, uh, some pleural thickening and some interlobular septa thickening, not that much. Uh, again, minimal areas of reticulation, uh, no honeycombing so far, no traction bronchiectasis, more peripheral areas of thickening, uh, um, airways look relatively okay, I don't see traction bronchiectasis going further down, uh, not a very good quantity study with a lot of respiratory motion. Um, again, some reticulation in the periphery of the right lung, maybe a little bit in the left mid lung zone. Uh, patchy areas of opacity and interlocular septa thickening, uh, no traction bronchiectasis, no honeycombing, more of the same. Going further down, one important thing when, when we are thinking about the possibility of sarcoidosis with the history provided. Uh, uh, sarcoidosis is a very tricky disease that can mimic anything you can think of, but things like uh, uh, areas of interlobular uh, uh, nodularity in the fissures, for example, which I don't see in this point in time, is something that I would like to see. Uh, predominant upper lobe disease, there is some of that, but here more <coughs> articulation, so, so far, just very minimal interstitial pulmonary fibrosis in a very non-specific <laughs> pattern in this initial CT. Should we move to the next uh, current high-resolution so CT? Yeah, one, so, one second. Yeah. The 2006 diagnosis of sarcoid use standards based on CT. Yes, sir. The answer is no. Correct. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's going to occur. And, and, and another, oh, hardly. another important point is that at that time, he was 27 years old. And that in itself is something that we don't see uh, uh, pa patients so young with sarcoidosis. Uh, and they usually manifest a little bit later in life. So that is a, a little bit interesting. Now, uh, clearly, progressive disease. You can see more significant uh, fibrosis and interlobular septaning and reticulation throughout the bilateral lungs. Uh, interesting that I see some uh, uh, nodularity and irregularity in the, in the fissures, uh, more interlobular septal thickening or reticulation, um, probably some traction bronchiectasis, and again, the fissures are abnormal. Uh, a lot of uh, uh, maybe minimal centrolobular nodules uh, in the bilateral lungs, more fibrosis. The disease has significantly progressed. Uh, throughout the bilateral lungs. Um, no honeycombing, no convincing honeycombing. I will say that this minimal uh, cystic area that I see probably represent bronchiolectasis. Um, so in, in, in this particular case, um, clearly advanced degree of pulmonary fibrosis that has advanced significantly. Um, this is not UIP. Uh, I will say that there are some features that are, uh, make me consider an alternative diagnosis. The, uh, the, in particular, this nodularity in the fissures is something that is not characteristic, there is no honeycombing. Um, the question here is whether, I don't, and I don't have exploratory images, but on these images, uh, the question is whether we consider this indeterminate, uh, or if someone is bold enough to suggest an alternative diagnosis, Based in the history of sarcoidosis, based in the fact that there is some uh, interlobular uh, uh, reticulation and nodularity in the fissures, uh, I would say that uh, sarcoidosis is not an entirely uh, bad uh, diagnosis, but this is not UIP. I wouldn't call this UIP. So, so this, this CT, 10 years later, has got a little bit more nodularity. It's got a little bit more hugging towards the fissures. So this is a little bit more in keeping with the sarcoid diagnosis mm -hmm. rather than the 2006 one. <coughs> On top of it, there is also subpleural reticulation. So this may be in terms of uh, a combination of sarcoid plus UIP as a, as a phenotype, as a coexisting disease. Mm -hmm. It may be, that's what this might pan out to be uh, in terms of a disease. Yeah. Because remember, the mother also has got some history of fibrosis. Some. So there is a familial 
predisposition of whatever is going on mm -hmm. in this family. So this would be a possibility that that could be a pill two disease in one person Correct. or a coexisting phenotype. Uh, but, so the question is uh, whether to do a bronchoscopy, lavage, transbronchial biopsy to see if you have granuloma or whether you want to get a more bigger pieces in two or three different places to to, to really clarify the diagnosis. Yeah, that's the question. So yeah. what, what are Let thoughts? me uh, just follow up and it's actually the same question from the, the prior case. So Ganesh, if you see typical non caseating granulomas and you see in conjunction maybe from different areas a URP pattern, mm -hmm. would you give him two diseases or would you say this is URP from a uh, URP pattern secondary to the sarcoid? Yeah, this is basically a, a phenotype or a question phenotype. We described this in the, in the respiratory medicine not too long ago, a few months ago, but a series of 30 some patients from my center who has a, this kind of a pattern, a history of remote sarcoidosis diagnosed by however, and then manifesting UIP-like pattern or UIP. So I don't know whether it is two disease in one person or whether it is a totally different phenotype. The same story about CPFV, whether it is fibrosis and emphysema, uh, patient with emphysema having IPF later, or whether it's two different disease in one particular host as a peculiar phenotype is all research questions. Now, I dare say we've seen the same thing at Chicago as well, where you have two distinct, supposedly distinct entities coexisting in the same patient, sarcoidosis and a UIP pattern in younger patients, yeah. which don't fit the classic demographics of IPF. So we don't really know what to do with it, or it's a trend we definitely have been so, seeing. So this one, I would think that they, there would be, depending upon which sample, in the right upper lobe, there would be some non-casing granuloma, typical of sarcoid. And in the other places, there will be some UIP-like pattern. This is what I think, this, this is what the diagnosis is. So the CT you're seeing here is the, for the, the, sort of the, se the second pulmonologist that saw him 10 years later, right? And he repeated all the uh, serologic evaluation, which was negative. And uh, I think at that point, the decision was uh, to move forward with a surgical biopsy. Because he was a Caucasian person, the C he wasn't convinced that the CT was a slum dunk for, for sarcoidosis. Uh, so I, I think the workup was quite appropriate at that time. Uh, and, and yet we did not have the precise diagnosis of the mother because she was a bit away. The other thing is this guy is short of breath. He is, yes. Right. He's not, he, he well, should, but, he, but, wait, wait. His shortness of breath is out of proportion to the lung function status. Yeah. It is. Right, because the DLCO is 89% perfect. it has got a preserved vital capacity. So his shortness of breath is really, really out of proportion to the lung physiology. So therefore, if this guy has sarcoid, I would be concerned about his cardiac sarcoid, would be looking into the echocardiogram evidence of other symptoms. Yeah. So the timeline, Ganesh, the, the first CT, the first PFTs I showed was paired up with the 20, 2006. I see. The, in this second one, he did have a decline in lung function that okay. I'll show you. Right. Bit. But very good point. I think we have a this. comment or question from the yeah. audience. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, so I think that nobody in the audience has any doubt that this guy should be biopsied. However, the question is, what is the, uh, uh, the best biopsy uh, strategy in this case? So if a uh, sarcoidosis is high in the differential diagnosis, maybe start with just TBD. Fair enough. Any, any I don't thoughts? think that's unreasonable, yeah. yeah. Any other points? So uh, just a quick question. Uh, did you guys do uh, ACE level in that patient or hypercalciuria? That. His ACE levels were normal. He did not have um, uh, his calcium, serum calcium was normal. I did not see uh, calcium in the urine, no. So, right. so why are you asking ACE levels? Are you doing ACE levels regularly now? Not in uh, the one, but I was. it was my understanding that with sarcoidosis, you do see uh, an increase. Yeah, in the problem is that it's insensitive and non-specific, so yeah. it won't lead you in one way or other. You have all clinical suspicion that this could be sarcoid. The ACE level is going to be normal or high. It's not going to make you a diagnosis one way or other. So therefore, I have taken the strategy of not requiring ACE levels in any patient, unless yeah. this is totally atypical and the biopsy, you are reluctant to the biopsy <coughs> for whatever reason. Yeah, I look at them if they're available from the records, but I don't work mm -hmm. the same approach. And the second question is, um, are, would you uh, see any lymphadenopathy in that CT? Would you, if you comment on it? Uh, lymphadenopathy is, is an important uh, point to keep in mind that can be extremely confusing. 
Why? Because you have reactive lymphadenopathy in many interstitial lung diseases. Uh, up to 70% of patients with UIP, for example, will have metastinal lymphadenopathy. And in a stage four sarcoidosis, assuming that this is sarcoidosis, which I'm not sure, you can have diffuse interstitial lung disease without lymph nodes enlarged uh, visible at the time of the inter you know, pulmonary involvement. So it uh, doesn't really help that much, the presence or absence of lymphadenopathy in, in many and in this case. But, but your point is well taken. If there's a big juicy lymph gland, you might want to go to another tissue to see if, if that's, if that's yeah. what you're trying to get yes. at. Uh, I have a question about the history, too. Uh, I was just wondering in 2006, 10 years ago, how was the sarcoidosis diagnosis approached by the prior physician? And then my second question is you know, at that time when that patient was seen, would any of the panel consider, because he's such a young person, would have considered a surgical lung biopsy at that time? Because now I think it's more evidence, just a debate of what kind of biopsy he would need to have. So it, it depends. I mean, 2006, when he was 20 some years old, gentleman, uh, why that CT scan was done in the first place in terms of how functionally impaired he was, but based on the physiology, it was not. So therefore, the mood point in terms of the diagnosis, whether were not to have pursued it, it depends on the clinical situation. Yeah, you're right. I mean, if I were to have seen, if he has come to see me or you for a respiratory problem, so he must have some symptomatic, or if it were to be an incidental pickup for whatever other reason, then you could simply wait and see how he does. Yeah, and this is, again, an, an athlete, right, that, that his threshold for symptoms is much lower than, than most of us, including, so, yeah, but that's a very good point. I. In retrospect, right, uh, hindsight is always twenty twenty. You, you, you might have, I, I probably, I had the same question to myself and I probably would be, have been tempted to biopsy him at that point. Yeah. Do, do we have any idea as to the temporal relationship between the woodwork exposure and the most recent CT scan? How far apart were they and how much was the woodwork exposure? Uh, he he uh, sort of makes furniture uh, at home. He doesn't do any uh, sanding or anything like that. No, no, it's so good it's point. nails it's, wood. It's a good point. I mean, if it, 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 in 2006, it was not been exposed to wood, and now if he is, and it, it depends upon actually what type of wood, okay? That's what uh, you need to get a history. Is it cedar, is it fir, or pine? And it turns out in epidemiological studies, the exposure to pine wood is much more associated with pulmonary fibrosis rather than other kinds of wood. So it has been looked into uh, in terms of an epidemiological association of what kind of wood, or is it wood pulp or wood dust or sawdust or such. So pine wood is one that would be associated epidemiologically with pulmonary fibrosis. Uh, cedar wood uh, is associated with hyperactive airways pretty much, and the fir wood is pretty much okay. Excellent, good to know. So he had a biopsy, he walked in with a biopsy. So Dr. Johnson, we have uh, high hopes for you. In this case, it's a bit more and Hopefully, perplexing. the surgeon and the pulmonologist coordinated a biopsy in two, three different lobes. Of course. I mentioned all the interested in knowing, was there conversation before with the surgeon about where you want the biopsy taken? It has to be that way. Yes, yes. Can you all hear me? Yeah, you're good. Um, no granulomas. Which lobe? No granulomas. Which lobe? Oh, all, all lobes oh, all are lobes. the okay. same. Uh, yeah. And there's some variability. I think one of the things uh, right out of the, the shoot here is that the alveolar tissue in this area looks intact and there's no inflammation. This airway is a bit thick. It has a too much smooth muscle and too much collagen and there's some prominent bronchus associated lymphoid tissue. There are a number of small airways that again have peribronchiolar metaplasia, reepithelialization around this main airway here with dilatation of spaces and uh, larger airway type epithelium. And again, the alveolar component of the acinus is normal. Um, this is an airway that's quite scarred. It obviously is too much adventitial tissue out here, a lot of uh, lymphoid inflammation, and then a lot of this black pigment, which a little bit of that is normal, particularly in city dwellers, but for a man his age, it's way in excess. 
And when I see that, what I typically am thinking is that there may be some polarizable particles related to an exposure. And I'll show you a picture of a polarization here in just a second. But there were a number of airways that had this sort of cicatricial stellate scarring that were essentially completely obliterated. So this is a small airway focused process that has been going on for a very long time. And so this is an alternative diagnosis category biopsy. Um, and again, just a, a low power view that shows one other feature here. Uh, let me back up here. Um, small airway here with the dilated mucus uh, trapping. And then here's a septum and some paraseptal scarring. But I think there's a small airway right in here. And again, the alveolar tissue is normal. Um, there were a few areas of microscopic honeycombing. And um, when you polarize the areas of pigmentation, there are actually a number of polarizable particles. And they're fairly frequent and abundant. And they're amorphous and variably chunky. They are not the needle-like particles that we typically see in silica. And I don't know what they are. Um, obviously, woodworkers don't inhale polarizable particles. And I can't identify this. But if with no other history than what I had, I emailed and said I thought this was some kind of occupational or avocational exposure and that he had a small ear once to see. He wasn't uh, in the military at all, young no. guy. He was not. I'm going to stop there. And yeah. The yeah. So yeah. no history of pollock exposure? No. Right. No, we, we could not squeeze any exposures out except for the woodwork, which again, uh, no sandblasting, anything like that. Uh, I'm going to go forward so, and um, give you the follow up. He continued to decline, excess capacity. He had now occasional hypoxemia and exertion with disease, clearly uh, kept getting worse. The mother was finally officially diagnosed with IPF, but it was slightly interesting that she had had 10 years of progressive fibrotic changes in chest imaging, um, which, and, and it was still alive, which we see, but it was, was a, a bit interesting. And then the, 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 the straw that, or the two straws that broke the camel back is the fact that two of his four children now developed uh, exercise limitation and they were worked up and found to have interstitial abnormalities in the CT scan. How old uh, are those? Children? They were um, eight and eleven. They were also <laughs> athletes or swimmers, and they noticed that they were losing. No, they were winning competitions, and then all of a sudden they start losing. And and you know because he was he's a very attuned to the family history, he decided to have them uh, evaluated. And lo and behold, they have interstitial uh, changes. And uh, just to show his most recent PFTs. Uh, he has a, a more significant restriction with, a, with the FEC now 53% and the LCO down 48. And, and this is the decline in lung function since June 2008, all the way down to the last one, October 2019. So he has lost substantial amount of uh, lung function. Genetic testing uh, came back positive. Wait, wait, wait. For, I wanted to ask you the question before you put yes, it back. Yes, please. Why did you do genetic testing? It is clear that his family history. So why, what, what are you going to make out of that? Because I know that Correct. he's got family history. You've got a 30% chance of finding out Fair whether the Turk or Turk or Mugfai. Good question. What are you going to do with that? Remember which institution I'm from. So you have this no, It doesn't and, matter. And you, you, you do it for research purposes. So, I'm fully with it. Yes. But if you're doing it for a clinically relevant reason, uh -huh. so what are you going to make with it? Because for research purposes, Ganesh. I mean, that's, that's the main thing. Okay. Yeah. That's okay. Because yeah. the point here, what I want to make out, make is, we do know by GWA studies worldwide done mm -hmm. by so many, we have come up with three or four or right. five, right? The MUC5B, right. the toe lips, the, all the, the, the Turk and Turk and Tilam. Mm -hmm. We know that. But we also know that 70%, even though they have a strong family and sibling, we cannot Can find, find it. anything. Yeah. So, so therefore, it remains a very enigma in terms of the genetic markers is concerned because you are not going to manipulate anything differently in terms of therapeutic at the moment, pharmacogenomic, maybe the precision Correct. study that we're going to be doing mm -hmm. is going to be helpful in the future. But unless it is that uh, clinically, I'm not sure it's going to be distinguished a diagnosis yeah. of IPR because we said in the evidence-based guideline as well, you Correct. cannot distinguish based on a genetic marker that is mm -hmm. IPR. Yeah, I completely agree with you. And, and I, it's very well, point well taken. In fact, a lot of people ask, well, when do, are you guys ordering genetic tests on everyone? So absolutely not, right? It's expensive, and, and um, as you, as you uh, well point out, uh, these are not well validated, right? So this gentleman has, uh, he and his family have a, uh, a very um, 
rare surfactant protein C mutation that in silico uh, has been predicted to cause uh, pulmonary fibrosis. So, uh, and, and now uh, the, we try to, to obtain genetic material from the mother to see if she has the same mutation. But um, I think the, the polarizable material that we find on him, uh, I mean, the question is, is he genetically primed? And this is a guy in, inhaling something, clearly he got there, right, somehow, that then triggered that. And, but if that's the case, how to explain the children's um, uh, disease? You know, so it is a, uh, is a really perplexing case. Uh, Jim Lloyd found a, a very old paper suggesting that Plaquenil can, uh, can be effective in case of surfactant protein C mm -hmm. uh, uh, biology defects, and, and he's been treated with that, but to no avail, his disease continues to, to progress. Uh, I think the question now will be whether we give him antifibrotics. I mean, he's going to be evaluated for lung transplant soon. But um, uh, it's, a, it's a very per perplexing case. In fact, this case went through the MDD four times before we, we got you know, to this. I just want to come back to the question of genetic testing and can throw it open to the audience because my knee jerk with that family history and the children would be, yeah, we might not act on it, we might not know what to do with it, but let's get it and see what we got. At least it gives them something to hang their hats on. Mm -hmm. And it's the same as that woman who really wanted to know. And so I certainly wouldn't deny them the genetic testing, but you do the genetic testing knowing that, well, we're not quite sure what to make of it. And you could couch it as research, but I think it's also accruing clinical experience. Otherwise, we would be operating in a situation like this pretty much out of a black box. Can we throw it open to the audience? Who would recommend ge genetic testing or go with genetic testing in this case? Including genetic counseling, right? I mean, that it comes together. Correct. Yeah. The Who wouldn't? To the point when you make that statement, Steve, <coughs> recommend is a very, earlier this morning I made a, a, a distinction between a recommendation versus a suggestion in terms of if you want to use an evidence-based approach for any diagnostic procedure or therapeutic procedure or interventions. So yes, we would do a genetic testing, but then it will also be piggybacked with the genetic counseling because what is the genetic counseling going to do with that information when we really don't know whether it is an autosomal dominant disease or it is a recessive disease or a, what is the risk calculation? It's not like cystic fibrosis or not like other known genetic disease. This business about familial, genetic factors and inherited, there are three different reasons, definitions in terms of familial versus inherited versus genetic factors. There are three not the same, okay, because familial can have some history of inherited plus a, a bio behavioral pattern in the acquired environment. Genetic factors could be like dirt and turf or something genetic factors in terms of a pathophysiology of the mechanism of fibrotic patterns. Yeah. Inherited is cystic fibrosis, for example, <coughs> Down syndrome, for example. Clearly it is, and then you can have a genetic counselor say, okay, your likelihood of your offspring or sibling to have this disease is very high or given a calculated genetic risk. Those are the important aspects of doing the genetic testing. We're not out there yet to be doing it. It's, it's a buzzword these days. We should do a genetic testing. Well, I think this is a discussion to be had with the patient, whether you want to couch it as a suggestion or recommendation it's a discussion, and you don't have to say this is a suggestion or recommendation. You talk to the patient about it. But lack of knowledge shouldn't instill fear of knowledge. No, I understand. But I think we, you know, even, you know, even if we don't know what to do with it, but we have the ability, I think we've got to start somewhere. And you, you never know what you're going to find in a situation like this that may help them, if not now, in one year, five years, or 10 years, or the children's children. So. I think it's out there, and I, th I think that I would have the discussion if they said absolutely not, that's fine. I mean, they might say no just for you know insurance purposes, for example, Correct. and that's their decision to be made. Uh, but I think it's definitely a discussion no, no, to no, be no, had. I agree with that. So I'm not saying don't do it. It's, the point is, because we know clearly in this particular family there is a familial history. There's very clearly there, there's something going on genetically. Okay, whether it is uh, surfactants or MUC5B or telomeres or tolip, there is something clear genetic, which we don't know what it is about, 
which is how I would factor in the decision making process that yes, there are genetic studies that are out there. I don't know whether your insurance is going to cover or not. We can the look into no. it and I don't know what I'm going to do with the information, but I can give you the information. Yeah, I agree with that notion. I think it's got to be careful shared decision making between the providers and the patient and caregivers. Particularly as Dr. Levine mentioned earlier today in the context of telomeres, it could play a role in exactly. the decision making Correct. process regarding lung transplantation, post-transplant immunosuppressive therapies. So there are benefits to having that discussion with the patient, but ultimately it should be a joint decision making process. I think Correct. that's a very way to end discussion. Um, <laughs> uh, case three, uh, that, that one is special for Ganesh. Uh, this is a 61-year-old lady uh, who came, who was admitted to your hospital after a surgical lung biopsy. And then you called to provide consultation on diagnosis and management. She never smoked, very healthy, very active. Uh, and she tells you that in 2009, she had a sudden onset of profound weakness and fatigue. That's how she describes it. Seeing a rheumatologist, all evaluation was negative and, and symptoms went away after a few months and she was able to go back jogging, hiking, mountain climbing, and so forth. Seven years later, in 2016, diffuse aches and pains, had a shoulder chest x-ray that, that uh, revealed abnormal lung fields, a CT scan confirmed the presence of ILD. Uh, a local uh, rheumatologist saw her, she had an ANA 1 to 160. On one occasion, the double, double strength DNA was borderline positive, everything else was negative. The rheumatologist told her she had lupus and put her on Plaquenil. She had no exercise limitation, and, but she did have a persistent uh, non-productive cough. July 2019, so for three years, she was okay from a respiratory standpoint, even though she had ILD, quote, unquote. She had rapid worsening of dyspnea and exercise limitation, declined lung function. The rheumatologist added mycophenolate, uh, which led to substantial weight loss, 40 pounds. And then Benlista was added to the regimen, and she didn't improve. She had two, two doses of it and decided to stop taking it. She saw a pulmonologist in October who told her you should have a surgical lung biopsy. And then she had a biopsy and then she was admitted to Vanderbilt with a persistent air leak uh, and, uh, for investigation. So she had no stigma of CTD. The father was diagnosed with IPF in the late 90s, but died of cardiovascular disease. She had no occupational household exposures. In the physical examination, she had bibasal inspiratory crackles, very uh, consistent with what you hear with IPF. The BMI was 16, we talk about a very frail and chronically appearing lady. The CT from 2016 uh, is seen here. Thank you. So um, this is a, a, a finding that we don't typically see or commonly see in patients with UIP IPF, this degree of, uh, of uh, pleural thickening in the upper lung zone. Uh, with some interlobular septal thickening, that might be okay, but these areas are uh, relatively atypical for, for that. Uh, we go further down, you can see uh, um, kind of patchy nodular areas with very significant thickening of, of the tissue component. Uh, some interlobular septal thickening, probably some bronchial dilation as well. Um, and as we go down, the, uh, clearly, the, this kind of an inverted gradient in, this, uh, in the sense that seems to be more disease in the upper lung zones compared to the lower lung zones. And here, in the areas that are uh, abnormal, again, you see these kind of uh, uh, focal areas of uh, nodularity and, and patchy uh, 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 densities in the lung parenchyma. Um, so again, this will be inconsistent with UIP. Um, and I will say that it's indeterminate. I don't see uh, exploratory images. Uh, uh, upper lobe disease is a good consideration for uh, hypersensitivity pneumonitis. I don't know, we have uh, uh, expert. Yes, here are the exploratory images uh, going down. No obvious uh, errors of earth dropping, uh, but uh, I would say that there was, this will be, I will call this uh, indeterminate. Uh, this is not UIP and I don't see features that allow me to suggest one particular etiology, uh, but this is inconsistent with UIP. So, uh, uh, sorry, when you go up to the apical cuts, is there enough there to make you suspicious of pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis? Yes, um, um, that's a good point. In, in pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis, 
really the, the, the uh, distribution in the upper lung zones will probably thickening associated with interstitial chromophorosis is, is kind of uh, the most common uh, uh, pattern. But um, I will say that could perfectly be. Yeah. So would anyone be happy at this point to say that this lady has CTD ILD and, and be happy with uh, the microphenolate? Would you, would you be okay with the history? Again, yeah. ANA was low titer once. <laughs> Double strength DNA barely positive once. And in three other occasions, they were negative. So the situation of this is as follows. At age 54, she has some muscle weakness, unexplained myopathy, proximal muscle weakness that somehow got spontaneously better. She's a woman. So woman with younger age, relatively speaking, raises the possibility of an index of suspicion that we're dealing with a connective tissue disease. 10 years later or seven years later, she manifests interstitial disease and she has now ANA serology for some reason or other, somebody does it. I'm not sure whether that serology was completely inclusive of myositis panel. Was it completely inclusive of uh, MDA5, for example? The answer is uh, no. Because that, those were all done? No, not done. Oh, because those would be, would be give you a little bit of a high probability of boxing into a specific connective tissue disease based on serology and clinical features. She does have some aches and pains. She does have some arthralgia. And so the rheumatologists, so to speak, have given her a label diagnosis fitting into certain criteria for that is lupus. Lupus patients don't usually have interstitial pulmonary fibrosis. They loop among the lupus patients, they have pleuritis, pleural effusions, pericarditis. Those are the usual <coughs> manifestations of lupus, and they have alveolar hemorrhage syndrome, or antiphospholipid syndrome. Those are the pathways that I would be leaning towards lupus-associated interstitial lung disease. So short of not knowing whether all of those myositis panel, for example, the PL1 series, for example, the anti jo one series, or, or, or the MDFI was not done. So I would be wanting to know that before I conclude that this is really not a an incidental IPAF, or IPAF is what is interstitial pulmonary fibrosis associated feature of some connective tissue disease. Uh, I would fit, she would probably fit into a specific connective tissue disease or a autoimmune associated interstitial lung disease. She might blossom more overtly in another year or two, which we all know that you can have this and then blossom into it. So as far as that, uh, getting a biopsy, I'm not sure I would have gotten it. Because I would because doing a biopsy in a person who probability is connected to disease, the all patterns are described, right? You have described of NSIP, UIP, and this business of pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis, which is suggested in one or in the CT scan in the right side upper rope, there is a pleural thickening there. So PPFE, what is PPFE? Pleural pleuroparenchymal fibroelastosis was described by the National Jewish people in about six or eight years ago in about four or five patients. And then we now are discovering almost any other patient with interstitial lung disease have a little PPFE. So PPFE is a non-specific radiographic and histopathological feature, can be associated with UIP, can be associated with other uh, interstitial pneumonia as well. To your, to your point, Ganesh, I think that you nailed the most important point perhaps of the afternoon, which is if you're going to consider a patient for a surgical biopsy, right, which is not a benign procedure, yes. uh, had this lady gone through an MDD, Someone would have asked, okay, well, what, what, what about the other serological profiles, right? And, and they were not done. So clearly, the, the clinical evaluation had not been completed at that point. I think that um, I would have been comfortable calling her CTD ILD, if not IPAF, based on that. I, when you, initially, when she presented with weakness, I was very uh, suspicious of antisympathetic myositis, yeah, so, so right. which might still evolve. <laughs> But there's another reason that I wouldn't have done a VATS biopsy on her. I couldn't fail to notice her BMI 16. Currently 16, yeah. Currently 16. And it's no wonder she has an air leak because the, 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 the holes are probably very close to the surface. I wouldn't be surprised that they're coming in and out and that some of that air leak could just be entrainment of air. Yep. And I think, to my point earlier, you've got to pick the right <laughs> patients, otherwise VATS ends up getting a bad name, in a, mm -hmm. like, similar to the situation. So this has been in the interest of time. I'm going to go through your, the CT scans, which I think all of us recognize that um, it's much worse, right? Dr. Restrepo, you have any comments? Or no, I think that any, is more, any more obvious. Any particular pattern? That yeah, I, I, I would say that 
clearly, this is a disease that is a predominant in the mid and upper lung zones or, or more severe in the mid and upper lung zones. And it's a progressive process with a, a active, evolving, worsening pulmonary fibrosis that is not a UIP. Good deal. So this is uh, more data for you. So we did uh, things backwards, right? So we repeat serologic evaluation. Everything was negative, including a comprehensive myositis profile. Her aldolase was mildly elevated, 9.1, which at Vanderbilt is slightly uh, abnormal. Just very hard to, to judge in the context of someone who's losing muscle mass in the hospital for three weeks. Echo was uh, uh, normal, uh, and uh, they were unable to estimate the RVSP, but again, clearly a very sick person and surgical biopsy was reviewed. <coughs> so I had two biopsies, one from the lower lobe and one from the upper lobe, and the findings histologically don't correlate exactly with the CT scan, but the lower lobe biopsy looked like this pretty uniformly. I think I have one closer view of it. So the lower lobe biopsy, while generous, was entirely honeycomb. So there was, everything was end stage, and as you know, an entirely honeycomb biopsy, if that's all you have, is classified as probable UIP. So with the lower lobe biopsy, that's where we were left, but then the upper lobe biopsy looked very different. So it had pleural surface here, which looks intact and not too bad, a little bit of lymphoid inflammation, and if you can sort of imagine it, there's this wedge-shaped area of fibrosis here, um, some procedural hemorrhage in the air spaces, but this wedge-shaped area, uh, which is very characteristic of a UIP, early, very early UIP lesion, and we've got a couple of fibroblastic foci here. So one feature of the upper lobe is that it looks like it could well fit into a UIP category. However, um, there were linear areas of pleuropulmonary fibrosis, but with a lot of active inflammation, which is more than what you typically see in PPFE. So it, it had that feature, which is a little more ILD-ish. And in addition, there were two airways that showed peribronchiolar scarring, which is not a feature of UIP either. So it's a mixed pattern. And I think in the, in the MDD, we ended up calling it probable UIP, but it's got mixed features, and I think it probably fits with an IPAP. Did you see anything uh, vasculature? Any pulmonary hypertension features? No. Or any? no hypertensive changes, but I think if we measured the vessels carefully, we might be able to show statistically an abnormality. It wasn't obvious. Is, there's nothing here you're seeing that this is a possibly connective tissue disease associated. In other words, you're not seeing any, because we think about multi-compartment uh, histopathology in terms of pleura, vasculature, and parenchyma. So you're seeing the pleura, you're seeing some pleuritis, but it is beyond inflammation that you normally see with PPFE. Scarring, yeah. And so there is, so, so, but you didn't see anything connected to your disease no, associated, right? No, the pleural abnormality yeah. fits better in, yeah. in the PPS because it's but also in the upper lobe, not right. in the lower lobe. So, so but the point here is the rheumatological diseases will, could have pleuritis and inflammatory cells within the pleura, but usually it's in the lower lobe zone rather than the upper pleural parenchymal fibroelastosis part of it. So, so this person also has a family history. It looks like IPF, right? And there's a family history of Yes, yeah, so uh, asking her in more detail, apparently the father died in a small town in Indiana. Yes, I mean, in the, the 1990s, this IPF was just sort of out there. And uh, they're not sure. That's what they were told. So mm -hmm. it, it is quite possible. So the, the best we put together is that, I mean, we put this lady through two rheumatological consultations, and they say there is really... We understand there's a flavor here. There's a woman had a, a disease at an early age, but we can't find evidence Correct. now. Uh, could this be a case of familial IPF that can manifest earlier and sometimes have an atypical course? Uh, I think, be as it may, uh, she is now so far, far advanced that uh, we are trying to get her healthy enough for a transplant. No, I think this would be a familial IPF or familial yeah. predisposition, whether it's familial IPF or familial IIP. Correct. So it is Whatever familial. you call it. And so that would explain a little bit of an early onset disease. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I think your rheumatological panel is completely, and so based on a complete evaluation done two or three different times, mm -hmm. she does not fit into the rheumatological disease. So you will have to, by, by default or by appropriateness, you'll have to call it IPF. Correct. That's how we labeled her. As a provisional diagnosis of IPF, moderate yeah. to low confidence, but deal oh, with it. Oh, it could be higher confidence after the biopsies. Look at biopsies; it's quite sure. good, actually. 
for, for a but UIP patent. There, there are the a the PPFE, but PPFE yeah. can be associated but with sure. There was airway sensitive fibrosis. There was some pleural inflammation, right? Yeah. So yeah. I'm still very suspicious. This is a CTD that's yet to manifest. You can call an IPF. I probably would as well to get an antifibrotic treatment. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but I think this is going to be a CTD at the end of the day. Well, yeah. that, that, that comment that you just now made, mm -hmm. I will want to raise that because I'm going to call it IPF just to give her antifibrotic treatment. You said you raised right that? Thing. You're going to raise that? Yeah, so there's not a right way of, uh, of uh, approaching medicine. I'd, I'd, let, me, let me decouple those. I will call her IPF and then prescribe an antifibrotic, even though I suspect this is a CTD. Yeah, I, I, and, and I think that we all see I, the I same thing. I think that's okay from a yeah. that's why I said, you do on a more probable basis, this is IPF. Yeah, I think the message- I don't think it's uh, gonna know, be IPF at the end of the day then. I think the message is that, I think it's a very prime example of the fact that your MDD may not be able to come, come with a clean package diagnosis, right? You, you can have a provisional diagnosis that can be reassessed over time. It's quite possible being a young woman that she could manifest the uh, autoimmune disease later on, full blown, and that can be measured. But it, 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 when you do put your MDD together, don't be so anxious that it, you have to have an answer all the time. Sometimes you have things that are not as well packaged as, as this case. Yes. I have uh, time for one or two questions, maybe, but we are out of time in this room. So we'll do one and, and a second question. Uh, is, I have a question for Dr. Maven. Is there in those cases, which certainly I've seen those, you know, you have a strong feeling that it's a manifestation of IPF, but you're not too certain because it has this inflammatory feature and you're worried it's connective tissue disease. Would you put this patient on, would you continue this patient's immunosuppressant on top of tenintetinib? I, I think there is a case for that. Um, I didn't see enough inflammation on the lung biopsy to, to support that though. Mm. Uh, if there was a lot of inflammation in the context of this, I think it's reasonable keeping them on in, immunosuppression. Um, and, you know, from a pragmatic standpoint, we have seen cases with, that we've diagnosed with IPF, uh, clear UIP pattern, but our pathologist has said, well, there's much more inflammation here than I typically see with IPF. Uh, and we have, from a pragmatic pragmatic standpoint, treat those patients with immunosuppression just to see if we can get any component of a reversal and then introduce the antifibrotic after that. Other questions? Was she started on antifibrotics for you? No, so it, we've had a lengthy discussion with her. This lady is, um, has severe dietary restriction, restrictions. She has a lot of abdominal issues, chronic diarrhea. So uh, we felt that uh, her best shot at any treatment now will be really get her nutrition in, in, a, in a good footing. And, and her FEC is in the mid thirties. Um, so she needs a transplant. Yeah. We decide to wait until she get, gain, gains more weight and we can reassess the, the use of antifibrotics. Okay, I'm sorry to end and not get to case four, but um, we have reached the end of our time here. Uh, so I wanna thank, thank you. all the panelists and presenters. I have a